speech for Life on One. Hello, tonight we're at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. Six and a half million people come here every year to experience the various delights of the rides here, like this, the Big Dipper. Tonight, though, we ask, why do we go to such lengths to scare ourselves to death? And more importantly, are these rides as dangerous as they look? be looking at how Tesco and Marks and Spencer have built on one of Britain's last natural meadows and will be whizzing over the Atlantic to visit the home, the recycled home of a movie star. But now, back to the fun of the fair. Well, this is one of the scariest rides in Blackpool. It rocks and shakes so much you think the car's going to leave the track. And it makes you ask that all-important question, are fairs really safe? I sincerely hope so. Well, that's a question you may well have been asking yourself had you been reading the papers last Sunday. One of these contained pictures of a horrific accident that took place in Japan. The accident happened a couple of months ago at a garden festival in Osaka. What was surprising about the accident was that it wasn't a frightening white knuckle ride, but a gentle water ride traveling at only two miles an hour. A number of problems seem to have caused the accident, including the breakdown of a fail-safe mechanism on the ride itself and the fact that the operator didn't know the proper procedure for stopping the ride. So, when there was a problem with the conveyor belt, it wasn't stopped and the boats piled up. Now, this accident happened in spite of the fact that that ride had been safety checked by a government inspector. In this country, safety at all fairgrounds is the responsibility of the health and safety executive, and they recently commissioned a survey to assess the risks at fairground rides. Dr. Gitters, you were at the helm of that survey. Why was the study commissioned in the first place? Well, I think largely because of public concern. I mean, when you read in the newspapers the kind of account that we saw last weekend of the accident that happened in Japan, the public is bound to ask itself, well, if I go on a fairground ride, it, it seems thrilling, but is it actually risky? Is it really dangerous? Is it risky? Well, no, it isn't. Uh, I mean, the surprising thing we found was that it was actually more dangerous to drive yourself to and from the fairground than to go on the rides when you got there. Why do we misjudge this risk element, then? I think it's a matter of control. You know, if you're driving your car, you're in control. You feel that you can steer out of trouble or brake if somebody stops in front of you. And so, although it is actually quite dangerous to drive around in a car, you don't, you're not sensitive to that. You feel it's safe. But of course it isn't, because we aren't always in control. Well, no, you're not. And, uh, I mean, somebody runs into you, and, or you run into somebody else, and there's an accident, and that really happens quite often on the road. What we found was that it hardly ever happens on a fairground ride. So what are the real chances of us having an accident on this ride, for example? Well, if you were to go on this ride ten times, then according to our study, you'd have 0.04 chances in a million of being killed. Well, that's uh, four chances in a hundred million of dying if you went on it ten times. I mean, it really is negligible. And compared with that, the risk that you run from crossing the road or driving about in the motor car or even going upstairs and, you know, risking falling down again are much greater. Does that mean that you can be complacent? No, no, because, of course, there are accidents and uh, our analysis showed that uh, very often, it was human error that was, uh, that was the cause of the accident. So, so you can do something about that. What were the report's recommendations then? Well, we recommended that the operators should be trained. They should be properly trained to be competent in, in uh, operating the ride, so that they operated it sensibly and safely. And then we said uh, the public should behave themselves. I mean, here we are going around in perfect safety in this ride, 
We don't have to be strapped in because centrifugal force is holding us down in the seat. I hope it is. <laughs> well, yes, it is. Dr. Gittes, thank you very much. are you prepared to take possible risks when it comes to your health or that of your family? Would the thought of a, a juicy beef burger make your mouth water or would it fill you with horror? I tell you what, there's a lot of... OK, so we've established that when it comes to risks, being at a fairground, there are hardly any. But why do we bother coming on these rides at all? With me is Dr. Glenn Wilson, a psychologist from London University. Are you all right on these rides, Glenn? I can think of things I'd rather be doing, but uh, anyway, here we are. Why do we, why do we get thrills from these kind of rides? I think every so often we like to raise a bit of adrenaline just to remind ourselves that we're still alive. And there's no better way of doing that than experiencing something approximating to a near-death <laughs> sensation. That again. We've got this highly developed emergency system which uh, evolved to deal with real threats like a saber-toothed tiger but of course there aren't too many of them running around our inner cities so we have to manufacture make-believe threats like horror movies and football matches and uh, funfair rides like this screaming our heads off <laughs> yeah so it's kind of a relief from boredom then that's right we're fighting boredom but we like excitement within a safe context it's rather like being tickled by somebody in a vulnerable spot, but somebody that you love and respect. Right. It's a mixture of tension and safety signals. Are there, are there some people who actually seek out thrills and sensations? Yes, there are great individual differences between people. Some people like to play Russian roulette. They're very sensation-seeking people. Others would rather stay at home by the fireside. If they were in positions of responsibility, though, they'd be dangerous people, wouldn't they? Well, I'd rather they weren't at the wheel of an articulated truck right. when can I'm on my way. Can we separate them out? Can we separate the sensation seekers? Yes, you can measure brain chemicals. There's one called monoamine oxidase, it's highly correlated, yeah. but in fact it's very much easier just to give you a questionnaire to ask you how sensation seeking you are. Which is exactly what we've been doing today. We've been handing out questionnaires and Sarah's got the details on that. Yes, I've got all these questionnaires back now actually. There are 500 here. I don't know about brave male sensation seekers. Those two sounded pretty nervous to me. Well, here they are, the questionnaires. We wanted to find out who are the true sensation seekers. You had to answer yes or no to questions like, would you turn down the chance to travel in space? Does scuba diving appeal to you? There are 10 questions in all, and we'll give you the results after our sideways look at a commercial break. This is for those people that prefer their mineral water au naturel. When you need a cool, refreshing glass of mineral water, what's more natural than the world's leading brand? Perrier. Naturally carbonated, natural mineral water. Naturel more. Oh, really? The bubbles in Perrier are not naturally carbonated. They are, in fact, added in their factory in France. Oh, dear. The American government told Perrier to change their label. Perrier said, Oh no, the gas is natural, natural CO2. Surely that's uh, okay. The American government said, Not okay. Perrier, over the top. Okay, now back to our questionnaire. We've got all the results in, and Dr. Glenn Wilson's been having a look at them. What, are, what have you found, Glenn? Well, as you might expect, Simon, the young people were more thrill-seeking than the older people, and generally speaking, men were more sensation-seeking than women. Why is that? Uh, it's hormones and brain chemistry again. Uh, 
People with low monoamine oxidase tend to be high sensation seekers and men have lower MAO on average than women. Okay. But uh, it's, uh, young women can be very sensation seeking. The difference only becomes obvious after the teenage years. Well, we have with us someone who's filled in our questionnaire. Altner, welcome to the program from Preston. Now, what's your job? I'm a mortgage broker. Okay, what kind, of, what kind of things do you like to do in your spare time? What kind of hobbies do you have? Well, the only spare time I really have is like driving fast when I get the chance. Do you like going to see horror movies and stuff? Oh, yeah. Now you've seen out this questionnaire. What did you make of it? Well, she's a high sensation seeker, all right. The, the driving is a little worrying, you know. Uh, <laughs> most fast drivers underestimate the danger of that, just as most people overestimate the danger of a ride like this. So look after yourself and everybody else on the road when you're doing your fast driving. Now, we've had many inquiries about our questionnaire, and if you'd like to fill it in yourself, we will give you details towards the end of the program. Sarah. The claim our company is friendly to the environment has become a slogan for the 90s. British coal, British gas, British nuclear fuels, British petroleum, the list is endless. Whether they really are or not is open to question, as Judith Burns discovered about Tesco and Marks and & Spencer. An attempt to recreate nature in a school field in Surrey. It's the result of a national competition sponsored by supermarket giants Tesco's. Tesco, Marks and Spencer aren't alone in building huge shopping stores on green spaces. Sainsbury's too are planning a superstore for Dog Kennel Hill in Dulwich. With me is Dr. Ian McKenzie, and in a few minutes, we'll be going on this ride, the Grand National. It was designed over 50 years ago. But of course, these days, the designers of fun fair rides have a difficult task, trying to come up with the extreme sensations that people want, whilst not putting them in any real danger. Well, in a few moments, Ian and I will be looking at the physical aspects of a white knuckle ride. But earlier today, Simon did a whistle-stop tour of the best or the worst, depending on your point of view, of the rides on offer. This is Blackpool's newest ride. It's called the Avalanche. It's supposed to give you the same emotional thrill as going on a bobsleigh without any of the dangers of going on the crest of the run. The feeling of excitement you get going on any ride is due to the physical upheaval that your body feels. And the designers have a whole series of tricks that they can use to thrill your body. Travelling extremely fast is always exciting and some of these rides can go up to 65 miles an hour. In everyday life you never experience high g-forces like these. They're created when you're spun around and accelerated very quickly. They push you back into your seat just as if you're two or three times heavier. Being thrown up and down was one of the first techniques developed to help supply a thrill and it's used to give you that heart-in-your-mouth feeling. The right designers also play with your sense of sight and sound, sometimes disorientating you with flashing lights and music, other times plunging you into blackness. Well, you may wonder what all that whirling round and round and bouncing about is doing to your body, whether in fact it could be a health risk. Well, squadron leader Ian McKenzie is a doctor. He's also an aerobatic flyer, so he knows all about the effects. He's done lots of studies on this. What's going to happen to us during this ride, the Grand National, Ian? Well, the first thing is we're going to measure your heart rate using this finger clip. Right. And in addition to that, we're looking at the G-forces that we're going to experience on this ride using an aircraft G-meter, which has been mounted on the front of the train. Now, in fact, the effects of this ride are already happening because your heart rate has gone up from its normal level of about 70 sure to around about 100, <laughs> just in anticipation. That's probably the major effect that the ride will have on you. But there are other things. As we go through the dips in the ride, your weight will increase two to three times normal, and the G-meter will show that, although there'll be some higher readings from vibration. This sends your blood, your blood down into your feet, It's very 
much more violent than you'd experience in an aerobatic aircraft. Good night, Payson. Next time I'm flying with you. And thank you very much. Thank you. And now for a very novel way of reducing litter. Over in America, one very well-heeled film star has found a very cheap way of building. With me now is Geoffrey Thompson. He's the managing director of Blackpool Pleasure Beach. We've heard the statistics about fares and safety here, and generally they're good news, but it is still a voluntary code. Do you think it would help if it was made legal? Well, the highway code is a voluntary code, and I think it works very well. Our industry has an incredibly good safety record, and as it's working so well at the moment, why change anything? Do you not think people would be more reassured if they could be absolutely see that it's written down in law passed by Parliament? I don't think it would, because it would make it so rigid uh, that you would never be able to change it without governmental permission if new rides were invented. The present system is flexible, it's a dynamic system, the HSE like it very much, we like it, we've got a good public record, you know, we're so safe, it's not true, we're not complacent, but the code is working well. How about things like putting up a safety certificate at the entrance to fun fairs? I think that's a great idea. We, of course, do it, we've done it for many years, and we reckon that everyone should do it. I think it's an excellent suggestion. So what about the future, Geoffrey? now? Uh, we're on a very nice, sedate ride with fabulous views as the sun sets over Blackpool. But how far can we go? What are your designers coming up with next? Well, we have some pretty exciting designers who are dreaming out wild ideas for the future. We're famous, of course, at Blackpool Place Beach for our great roller coasters. And we've dreamed up a new idea for a three-wheel roller coaster. Not too terrifying, is it? Well, it's going to be a bit weird, because when you go downhill, you think you're going to go uphill. When you go uphill, you think you're going to go downhill. Oh, my goodness. So it's going to be a bit of a mind-bender, I think. Anything else you got lined up? Well, we've got some new dark rides we're planning, which are going to take a sort of new dimension of scariness in, in the dark. We're going to get some possibly traditional rides, put them in a different concept, concept in a totally dark environment. Sounds terrible. You, you've it told is. me enough. You've told me enough. <laughs> Jeffrey, thanks very much. We'll just sit back now and enjoy the ride, I think. Thank thanks you. a lot. Enjoy Blackpool. If you want to find out how much of a sensation seeker you are, write to the following address for a copy of our questionnaire. Life on One, BBC TV, Kensington House, London West 14 OAX. That's Life on One, BBC TV, Kensington House, London West 14 OAX. And please enclose a stamped addressed envelope. Next week, Life on One will be on the beaches looking at coastal pollution. We'd like your views on this, so call us if you would before midnight tonight with your answer to this question. The waters of Britain, are they clean enough to bathe in? If you think they are, phone this number 0898 991188. If you don't think they are, phone this number 0898 991189. Until next week then, good night.